Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Hey, welcome to the Master Mix Podcast. My name is Mike Navina, and thank you so much for being here today. Today, my guest is Scott Michael Smith. Scott is an engineer who has worked not only in the music side of things, where he worked with artists like Katy Perry, John Mayer, Colby Calais, uh, Nas, Nelly, and so many others there, but he has largely transitioned into becoming an in-demand score mixer, where he records, edits, and mixes sound for film and television where he works with a lot of large orchestras, which we definitely talk about inside of this episode. And in the film world, he has a ton of great credits as well, having worked on The Revenant, The Handmaid's Tale, It Chapter 2, Minions, The Invisible Man, Mank, and so many more. And inside of this episode, we get into his process, and we really talk a lot about recording orchestras and what it's like to be behind the scenes doing that, and what it takes to run a session where you're recording an orchestra and trying to coordinate tons of different engineers and musicians and setting up a ton of mics and gain staging and all that stuff. It's definitely a very unique process, and if you've only ever recorded a band, When you hear what Scott has to talk about in this, I think you're going to just get a new appreciation for what goes into these orchestral recordings and ultimately what goes into making the music that we hear inside of the movies and TV shows that we watch. So with that said, let's just jump right into the interview. This is my interview with Scott Michael Smith. Scott Michael Smith, thank you so much for being on the Master Mix podcast. How you doing, man? Good. How are you? Doing great. <laughs> For people who might not know your story and who you are, what you do, how you ultimately got to where you are today, can you give us that quick story and fill us in? Sure. Yeah, yeah, of course. So um, I'm an engineer and producer, and but mainly a scoring mixer for film and TV. Uh, so quick background would be I grew up in L.A. playing music, um, went to school in, uh, in Santa Barbara here in California, and then actually transferred to Berkeley College of Music and got my... Uh, my degree there and wrapped everything up there. Um, I didn't do a recording program there. I just did like a kind of a general music degree. Um, graduated there, moved back home to LA, started working at the Village Recorder, which is a, a studio here in West LA, which is a legendary LA studio. Um, worked my way up to staff engineer there, where I was able to work on a bunch of really cool records. Um, then after that, basically just through a series of different connections, um, via work, you know, I worked on one record, which led me to the next thing, which led me to the next thing that intro to me, um, to, uh, Randy Spenlove, who was the head of music at Paramount, um, and still is the head of music at Paramount. And he started throwing me on film gigs and it was little things at first, like, Hey, can you record a guitar? Can you record a drum kit? Can you do this? And then after a few years, it was like, Hey, you know, we've got an orchestra that needs to be recorded. Can you do, you know, can you do that? And I was like, yeah, of course I can. You know, I'd never done it before. I was like, sure. Yeah, no problem. Um, sneaked by, you know, no one was the wiser, managed to figure it out. I guess, you know, it was good enough. I wouldn't say it was good. Um, and that was, man, over a decade ago. And I've been I've been kind of in film and TV ever since, uh, mostly film. That's amazing. I love that, that story about the orchestras because it's just like, yeah, sometimes you got to take those risks and just like, prove to yourself you can you can do it right and, and ultimately i mean that's how we all get into it we all take a chance and we try something that we've never done before and then we figure out if we're good at it or if we need to learn how to get better at it you know so <laughs> if you want to if you want to do something just say yes and figure it out you know it's 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 uh it's sink or swim truthfully and if you don't if you don't try you, you that opportunity might not come back for sure yeah and it's interesting because I, I was curious to know about how you got into recording orchestras because I, I feel like most people get into this as musicians themselves and, you know, get a basic grasp of like guitar, bass, drums, vocals, like those typical like rock instruments or pop instruments, whatever you want to call them. Right. Sure. Um, but then but orchestra is like that's something that just that's not an accessible instrument. You know what I, you know what I mean? Like it's, it, you require no. a lot of people, you need the facilities, you need the equipment. So like it, it's definitely got to be a big learning curve. So what was that process like when you were trying to figure out how to do it? So. I kind of viewed it just like a, like, I mean, this is the analogy. It's not even really an analogy. It's just an approach. And I still take this approach, but I just looked at it like a huge drum kit. 
Um, if that makes sense, it's like you've got all your individual parts, but all the individual parts, you know, are sum up to be a total picture, you know, when you use your room mics and things like that. So I kind of approached it that way. Um, you know, I did a ton of reading before I did my first orchestra session. I did, uh, I asked a lot of questions of a lot of engineers I used to assist. Um, there's a, there's a brilliant engineer I used to assist by the name of John Curlander. John, um, I mean, John was tape op on, on Abbey road you know, by the Beatles. Like, so he was, and he was in house at Abbey road has been all over the world recording orchestras. And so I got to work with him a bit and see how he did things. Um, and then, so, you know, when my opportunity came to, to record my first orchestra at a scoring stage here in town, I utilized a lot of what I learned from John then plus, you know, just a ton of reading. Um, and then just my own instincts as an engineer of like, okay, well, I understand the physics of this. I understand what's supposed to happen here. So then it just, then it just comes down to like your own paranoia of like, do I have enough microphones? Do I have, do I have every, every single, you know, nook and cranny filled with something I might need, you know, which is like the wrong way to go. But when you're nervous and don't really know what you're doing, that's what you're going to do, you know? Yeah. I guess it's better to be overprepared than underprepared, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's just, you know, throwing out what you view as a bunch of different safety nets, which is probably the right approach if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, hey, look, you you're prepared for it, so obviously, like, it, it worked because th- you you continued to do this, right? So you did something right with that first session. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. No, exactly. And it was, you know, after doing it, you know, the first time, I was like, okay, I understand this. This is truly no different than a drum kit. Um, there are there are focuses that need to be, you know, seen in certain areas. Like, you know, you might need more violins. You might need more cellos. You might need more woodwinds and that's not that much different than like, can I get some more kick drum? Can I get less, you know, less overheads? Can I get more snare? It's, it's the same principle as recording like a big rock drum kit. I think some of the, like, you know, the classical engineer guys would maybe disagree with me, but my approach has been like, I came from the record world. So this is, that's how I approach things. And that's how I will always approach things because that's how I learned. Yeah, for sure. Well, I would think that like in the record world, I feel like so many things are more close mic based, whereas orchestral stuff it tends to be a little bit roomier. So you probably had to lean a little bit more on room mics, I'm guessing, with that kind of setup, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, when you're recording an orchestra, you know, you could do it and get a pretty decent orchestra sound with just a stereo pair. You know what I mean? Because it's like there's the whole image. It's not going to be anything mind blowing, but you're going to hear everything if you have a you know a stereo room mic. So. But we rely mainly like, you know, on a deck of tree and then on on a pair of stereo wides um, surrounds since most things are in five one or higher formats like seven one or Atmos. And then you use kind of your spots um, or your section mics to pull out detail. So it's just different levels of focus. But I don't know that that's that much different than the way I learned how to record guitars, the way I learned how to record drums. Um, the engineers I grew up you know, working under um, guys like Ed Cherney or Joe Ciccarelli or Nico Bolas, like they, while like the snare mic's important, the kick drum mic is important. It's the close, you know, the, the close guitar mic is important, but it's all, it's always about like, put the mic where you get the most, like the sound of the instrument, the most cohesive kind of zoomed out picture of like, that's what that instrument sounds like. It's not so much about like, you know, individual Lego blocks building into this big thing where like, you know, okay, how good does the Tom sound, you know, with that Tom mic? It's like, that's there to add detail to the overall picture. And with the drum kit, like your overall picture is kind of your overheads, right? It's like your overheads, maybe your mono room mic or something. And like, so like, if you wanted to record a drum kit with one mic, you could totally do it. And if it's a good enough mic in the right position, you'll get everything you need. So with orchestra, it's kind of the same thing. It's just physically a lot bigger right it's you know it's in a hall and it's it's you know there's a lot more people to it but it's like that's why the the drum kit analogy for me works so well because it's like oh nothing else put one mic above the conductor in the right spot if it's the right mic it's like yep that will sound like an orchestra guaranteed for sure and i'm assuming like the rooms that you're working in have to be pretty incredible rooms to to begin with yeah we're we're very very spoiled and um we've got we've got three really gorgeous scoring stages here in town at Fox, Sony and Warner brothers. And then what's nice about working in film and just like from an engineering angle, it's just kind of a dream is that because projects have budgets, I get to work 
at Capital. I get to work at United. I get to work at East West. I get to work at the Village. So I'm bouncing around from you know studio to studio, and they're all the best studios in LA. So it's just kind of you know it's kind of dream come true engineering wise. You can use you know especially when you look at those mic lists. Yeah, of course. Like that. Yeah, those are definitely like up there as some of the best studios out there. You know. Um, I'm curious to know, like when you're doing these orchestral recordings, like how many microphones are you normally working with? And like, what's that setup time normally look like? So it depends on the size of the group. Um, let's say we were doing, well, actually like this weekend and groups are smaller now because of COVID, right? So we have to keep people distance so we can't have as many people, but miking wise, it's about the same. So like this weekend I'm starting a project and we're doing, I think it's 18 violins eight violas, six celli, four basses, maybe six woodwind players, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, to about nine or ten brass players. So it's a, it's a you know, whatever that comes to, that comes to 50-piece orchestra, something like that. So for that, I think I'm using somewhere around 40 microphones. Um, might be less. It's It's basically you've got, you know, you've got your five, six, seven mics that make up your main room mic situation i then do kind of overheads over the strings then you have spots on the strings which are much closer um then i'll do overheads over the woodwinds spots on the woodwinds and then kind of overalls on the brass as well as spots so the idea is like you have three levels of focus you have your your most zoomed out which is your room mics then you have kind of your overalls or overheads and then you have your spots and you use them for different reasons right so your your you know your rooms that's your main sound the overalls, that's a really great way to get a really good sound on something without hearing the individual player. Then it's like, okay, actually we need more of the second trumpet. Okay, then I can go to the spot mic and bring that up because, you know, something's written in the score for this, for that particular player. So um, it's a lot of microphones, but they're, they all have a reason and a purpose, you know, and um, with everything engineering, I'm always trying to just use less and less, literally of everything. So, um, anything that's there is there because I may very, very well need it. And if I didn't, I would get rid of it because I just want, I'm, I'm, I'm in this mode right now of like minimalism and just trying to streamline things as much as possible. Yeah. Well, I was curious to know if like you were summing things down at some point or if it's just still like every mic is on its own thing. Nope. Every mic's on its own thing. Um, you know, it's we deal with really, really heavy track counts in film and in scoring, and especially if we're working with someone who likes to uh, what we call striping. So it's this weekend we'll have strings, woodwinds and brass in the same room. If my client wants to have control in the mix and have the brass separate than the strings, we'll record just the brass. So those 40 mics will get recorded with just the brass. Then we'll go do the strings. So that's 40 more mics. So that's 80 tracks right there. Then maybe we'll do the woodwinds separately. 120 tracks. What gets crazy is certain people like a lot of control and you may get to, you know, 16, 17 and it's, it's absurd, but you may get to up, up around there as far as orchestral passes. So multiply that by the amount of mics you have. And when we get into those scenarios, you have to sum it down. So the start of the mix will be me going through and mixing those individual pieces into like a 5.1 composite file just so i just like literally just so i can get pro tools to play that's crazy <laughs> yeah yeah I, it's I, a lot of or, organization's a big deal for sure and and i definitely want to talk about that as well because i feel like you know some people just struggle with like recording a basic three-piece rock band you know because like they got so many so many tracks in their mix with like maybe 30 tracks or you know but then like when you're dealing with like two or three hundred tracks it's like it's, you- it's usually well that's and that's just the orchestra so that doesn't that doesn't count um you know what we call prelays which are the uh or pre-records which are the tracks that the composer has has mocked up or sequenced or pre-recorded before the orchestra so i get the uh i get the pro tools has run out of voices you know, prompt quite a bit because then, you know, it's, we, we also mix to stems, right? So I don't, I don't deliver a, like a stereo two mix. I mean, I do, but it's not the point. The point is, you know, maybe 10 to 15, 5.1 stems. So if I've got 10, 5.1 stems that I print to, that's 51 tracks right there, just as far as like voices and pro tools. And then, uh, each one's got its own set of dedicated reverbs, delays, all, you know, so it's just, it's a lot of 
it's a lot of voices for Pro Tools. I, I bet. That, that's 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 pretty impressive to me because I've never recorded an orchestra. So, I, I you know, this is all new to me. But but I imagine that, you know, to your point of being organized, there's got to be a lot of preparation going into these sessions as well so that you're working fast because orchestras are not cheap. And right. when you're hiring the best players, like it's it's expensive and they're not, they don't want to be there all day for something that I'm assuming should take a short amount of time. Right. Like how long do these sessions normally last? So sessions are generally booked in three hour blocks. Um, so, you know, a full day of recording will be two, three hour sessions. Um, so, you know, we might start 10, go 10 to one and then take an hour break, come back, go two to five. Um, and then oftentimes take an hour, another hour break. If we do what, what's called a triple and we'll do six to nine. That's like a really, really um, old school standard that, you know, like Motown used to do that. It was three hour sessions. And, you know, that's just how things have been recording like union musicians in the United States for, you know, as long as there's been a musician's union and recording. Um, but you know, you might do that over five days, right? So it's, it ends up being, it ends up being quite a lot of time. Um, but yeah, to your point, yes, you need, you need preparation and truthfully as, as you might be able to guess, that's not a one man job yeah i was right? gonna say you have to have assistance i'm sure there's it's it's there's assistance but then there are also in in the film world and in, in the orchestral recording world there are people that are you know i get to work with with you know absolute pro tools ninjas who they sit there just you know they're just dedicated to pro tools so their job is making sure we get everything recorded getting everything recorded in a way that makes sense for when i go to mix it later um, keeping things organized, doing take notes, doing edits on the fly, uh, you know, managing the click and making sure that's okay for everybody. So that's like one person's job. You then have someone else at the stage who's just doing headphones for the orchestra because no one else has time to do that. So that, you know, you have someone out on the stage who's got a console and is just doing monitor mixes for the orchestra and the conductor. Um, it is, it is 1000% a team effort. And it's, um, that's the only way it works. You know, I get to sit there, I get to dictate what mics I want. I get to go set up what mics I want. Um, I get to sit at the console and I get to mix as we're recording. But my main job is to sit there with my client, who's the composer and really work out what's happening and what's being recorded and how it's going to serve the eventual, you know, vision we need to end at. Yeah. So, so you're almost like taking on more of like a project management kind of role to some degree. Kinda. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of it that there's quite a lot of project management that goes into it. Um, what's nice is, you know, I work with the same people over and over again. So everybody knows, you know, everyone's got their strengths, everyone's got their skill sets. So it's like, I'm bringing so-and-so on to do this. They'll, they're just going to take care of that because, um, fortunately in LA and in the film world, we have a lot of really, really great just professionals, you know, who they just do this for a living. And it's, um, so it takes a lot of that stress off, but yeah, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of collaboration in, in preparation. Yeah, it, it has to be. Otherwise I'm yeah. sure that, you know, you're, you're losing money all over the place, right? <laughs> totally, totally. And then you don't get hired on the next gig. So, exactly, you know, exactly. it's, you gotta, you gotta, yeah, you can't go over budget. Yeah. So then it's cool that you had mentioned that there's like a headphone guy, there's a pro tools guy. I'm assuming that things like, uh, like preamps when you've got like a lot when you've got like 40 50 mics on an orchestra like you know setting your gain staging and all that stuff that, I'm sure that's got to be super important and there's I'm assuming there's someone whose job is just the preamps or like <laughs> okay so it's 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 such a funny thing you bring up because uh yeah I mean basically what will happen is if you've got 40 mics right and you don't get there's no sound check, right? There's no there's no getting sounds. It's like we maybe we get the first take and we and I can ask for them to redo that because I was still getting levels or something. But like after a minute or two, that's it. That's all the time I get. It's I don't get to dial in sounds. So anyway, it's <laughs> <That's> insane. <laughs> each yeah. So I mean, each of the uh each of the stages here in town have, you know, a recordist who's just there there's I guess you know, they're essentially the second engineer. Um and they're all really highly skilled people. And the thing is, they've got the, uh, if, if something's peaking, if something's clipping, they'll pull it down. They, they won't even ask you. They'll go, you know, that's not supposed to be clipping. They'll walk around. You go down to the other end of the console, pull that down. And that is just so greatly appreciated, you know, because it's just, 
yeah, you can't possibly manage it all. The other thing is a lot of these guys have been doing it for so long. They kind of have a basic idea of where the gain should be. Um, so we'll preset a lot of gains um, and then we'll adjust whatever we need to adjust. And it gets a little, you know, it gets a little hairy when you've got things like percussion, like large tycos and really, really loud stuff. But um, for the most part, it's like, okay, I know a pair of N50s on a deck of tree are going to need to be around 40 dB of gain. So we'll start there and then we'll adjust. But it's, uh, yeah, again, it's a team effort. Yeah. And uh, are you guys using a lot of like analog setups with this or is it digital based or? Uh, so it it really depends. I think most people just because of the uh, the points you're bringing up about how much needs to happen in such a short period of time. Um there's not a whole ton of like outboard gear that'll be brought in for it. It's usually just, uh, you know, mic to mic pre to pro tools. Um, some people are different and like, I, I will certainly not, you know, I've, I'm, I'm not afraid of popping in the EQ on the desk or anything like that. Um, but bringing in a bunch of gear and bringing in, you know, an entire new loop of cabling per channel. It just, it just adds so many more things that can go wrong. And like you said, you can't keep all those people waiting. So, you know, you'd kind of want to go as simple as possible because it's, you know, every new piece is every new cable, every new piece of gear is a potential new, you know, new pitfall. So it's just keep it simple, keep it straightforward, uh, put up some really, really killer microphones, put them up in the right place, have a great orchestra, great music. And, and that part of the job does itself. Yeah, I would assume that like digital boards would be more popular because you could save your templates of all your gain and all that stuff and, and have it kind of ready to go, right? So digital consoles for mixing, for sure. No doubt about it. But um, the standard for scoring stages in LA and also at Abbey Road um, are 88Rs, Neves. And the reason that console is so great is Encore, the onboard automation system, has a full recall. So there's literally like, it's, it was funny when I was an assistant, we had 88 hours and it's almost like a little video game. Like you go through recall to show you on the screen, the channel, it'll show you where, you know, any specific knob on the console is. And then there's a line of where it needs to be. So you can recall all the gains it's manual, but there's a, it's not like the, you know, it's not like you're drawing it on paper and trying to recreate something. So you can recall gains pretty quickly. Yeah, that well, that definitely helps then, because if you have that template to go off of, then yeah, that that saves you time, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's more um, as far as like the recalls, you know, that's something that really comes into play on television where you have something where you're coming back week after week for different episodes of the same thing. Right. And you're going to use the same setup and the sound needs to be cohesive. But on a film, generally, you know, we'll go into a scoring stage for a week, maybe a week and a half, and they'll take a recall because, you know, if we need to come back and do a pickup date, sure. But there's not um, there's not much need to constantly be recalling the console in that scenario. Yeah, makes sense. So are you you're you're obviously playing a big role in the recording stage of it. Are you mixing these productions as well after the fact? Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, and oftentimes I'm doing more mixing than recording because with orchestra, a lot of recording happens in different parts of the world. So whether that be for budgetary reasons or you know, tax break reasons for the production. Um, we, you know, I do a lot of work and record, you know, a lot of things are recorded. Like for instance, in Vienna, there's a place called the Synchron stage, which is a beautiful scoring stage in Vienna. They do a ton of work. They have an amazing team over there and they'll send me files and then I'll sit with my client and I'll mix. Um, same thing with Abbey Road or Air in England. Um, also lately I've been doing things with Bulgaria, Macedonia, uh, Budapest. So all over Eastern Europe, there's a lot of orchestral recording that happens. So I'm generally probably mixing twice as much as I'm recording. That, that's cool. So you, you had mentioned earlier, like organization. And again, I, I feel like when it comes to the mixing side of it, you, you've got to be super organized for that. You know, I, I, I used to work in audio post-production doing like sound effects and, and dialogue and putting all those together and mixing that. And you know, I remember having sessions of like a couple hundred tracks just of dialogue and sound effects and, and thinking like, man, this is a lot of stuff to go through. But we were getting sub mixes of the orchestral mixes and all that kind of background noise, back, background music. So, you know, like 
someone else was handling that division. And I know like there's so many different divisions in audio in the post-production world, right? Like you got your your Foley, your sound effects, your your mixer, your ADR people. <laughs> so, it, you know, there's I, I don't think people realize how many tracks there are that make up these movies that we watch or TV shows that we watch, right? Um, but organization was definitely the one thing that I learned. Like you had to have a system to be able to work fast because you can't take weeks to finish a mix or, you know, or maybe, maybe you can with the projects you're working on, but like, you know, you have to, you have to be working very efficiently. So I'd love to learn a little bit more about your, the efficiencies that you've created for yourself and how you keep organized. Sure. Um, it, it depends on what, what, what part we're talking about, but yeah, you're right. Like with a film, um, like with something like we're just music's just one department, right? And you're right. There's all these different things that are all, you know, all these different tracks that distill down into one little droplet that ends up as that's the movie. Um, so you're right. So we're working in tandem at the same time as, you know, effects, Foley, ADR, all of that. Uh, so as far as organization, I mean, the first thing is like, if you have a movie, you know, if I, if it takes me two weeks to mix, you know, let's say 80 minutes of music for a film, that's, that's the thing we do. We do a tremendous amount of music in short periods of time. Um, even when we have more time, it's generally cause there's more music. So like, you know, it's very different than album mixing. Um, but as far as like, you know, number of minutes that we, that we go through, it's, it's pretty crazy. So the first thing, and this is like, the the single least exciting organizational tool but it's just it's just saved my life a million times is a google doc google docs and spreadsheets just really simple it's just got you've we've got every queue listed we call every you know piece of music in a movie is called a queue um there's a status bar for where it's at has it been prepped has it been recorded has it been mixed has it been edited etc etc all the way down what's ready what's not ready um and we kind of live and die by that and so that's kind of that's the number one first kind of more overreaching administrative organizational tool, because what's cool with that is, you know, you can share it with whoever needs to be on it and different people can be updating it. You know, if I have someone editing orchestra and someone else doing my mix prep, both of them can be, you know, updating the Google Doc. So that's like the least audio and the least exciting thing, but it's but it's super important. But sometimes that's what it is, right? Sometimes like the non-audio things are the most important parts of our process. Well, totally. And it's like, you know, when I started, I used to see when I was a runner going into studios, you know, you'd see the big whiteboards, right? With the uh, with the checkerboards like, OK, here are the songs, drums, guitars, vocals. And, you know, people would go through and X out what was done on what song. And uh, this is just that. It's the same thing. It's just a more, it's just a, it's just a deeper, more involved version of that same exact thing. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so, um, so that's that. And then as far as like mixing, you know, I have a template that I've created and I take it from project to project and it, it's constantly being updated and changing. So, you know, if I'm using a certain kind of EQ across my, you know, my strings, I decide to change that, then, you know, I'll, I'll save that. And the next, next project I start, that'll be my, you know, my starting place for that. And so that's hugely helpful organizationally because no matter what, I mean, I'm fully in the box, 100% of the box mixing. So no matter what, I've got all this stuff built in and I know where everything is. So I've kind of, in that sense, like your template becomes essentially your digital console, right? If you're on an SSL, if you're on a Neve, depending on the board you're on, the EQ's in the same place, the compressor's in the same place, the mic pre's in the same place, you know, you've got your small fader, your big fader. I essentially have, our template is the digital version of that. So organizationally, it kind of doesn't matter what the music is. I know exactly where to go if I want to put delay on something. You know, there's already a send built in. I can click on it, I put push the fader up, and, and right away you've got delay. So just little things like that um, are you know, completely necessary to be able to move quickly. You can't go into the sends window every time you want a reverb. There needs to be a reverb send assigned already. And then you just decide if you're going to push it up or push it down. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Going through plug, adding plugins to every single track. Like, <laughs> right. Just I mean, a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. And that, you know, that obviously you still do. And that's where, you know, a lot of the fun resides, right? Is like you get, you get tracks and you still got a mix. So like 
you can't you can't have a template for the music that's coming in your templates for you know maybe your basic reverbs your basic processing but as far as mixing you still got to do the work so yeah, of course. yeah no i mean as far as that like I, it's it's if i get a drum kit it's like all right cool let's bring all the faders down put up the kick in mic all right cool how am i going to eq this what i'm going to do here it's like that's that's just no different than an album for sure well, I know so many people set up their templates in different ways, and some people it's just like having the the buses and the master, and like you know having a couple plugins on there, and then they'll just apply their you know they'll import a bunch of tracks and you start from scratch with those. And then there's other people who will take those tracks, drag them into like preloaded tracks with with plugins and all the all the routing already busted and all that stuff. So it sounds like you're taking more of the approach of like you've kind of got the the higher higher level stuff set up in your template your 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 effects your master buses your your instrument buses and all that kind of stuff and then you're you're importing that new recording into that template right exactly and then like just what what i try to do if um if it's ready and if time allows is i try to go to the end of the movie find you know like the biggest piece of music because that's most likely going to have the most tracks i'll mix that first then that those tracks actually become the template for that film so that every time we rehear the same sound, the processing I did on that, that my client approved instantly gets applied and I don't have to recreate it every single time. So that that's, that's in the mix prep stage at that point. And then I can adjust and change things from there. But um, yeah, I've kind of got my overall template is about my routing, my effects and my general processing. I then will do the first couple mixes then that becomes a much more uh, detailed template, which gets used for the rest of the project. It makes a lot of sense to do it that way. That's that's smart because because yeah, you do have a lot of the same cues pop up over and over again. So if you if you've got it it's, done, right. it's really it's it's really no different than like if you if you're mixing an album, right? And all the drums were recorded at the same time, same mic, same everything, and you do the first track, and you're like, okay, this sounds great, and you're you're happy with it. The band's happy with it, and they want you know maybe. Maybe it's not a heavily produced album. Maybe it's meant to sound kind of, you know, just live or jammy, whatever it is. You're going to keep the same drum sound through the entire record, right? So it's no different than you go to that next session, import session data, update those tracks. Boom, there's your same drum sound from the last song. It's it's exa- it's exactly like that, just um, over a bunch more tracks. Yeah, absolutely. So how much, like, are you actually applying process? Like, are you are you mixing from the individual tracks or do you typically just go bigger picture and you're using those buses a lot more? Uh, it depends. So for the orchestra, a lot of it is bus processing. So, you know, I've got, let's say those 40 mics we talked about, right. Um, those will be, he- those will be going through a bus and I do a lot of processing on there. And then obviously the balances, like the actual fader levels have been done before. And that's, that's the first decision I make. And then those go through a bus. I'll then process on that bus. Oftentimes I used to do it. I used to send reverb off the individual tracks with orchestra. And now I send reverb off of that bus. Um, it's frankly just more convenient. You get one reverb send for the whole orchestra, which yeah, is nice. You're probably sending everything to the same thing anyway. Right. So. It, yeah, exactly. And it's, you know, uh, different people do it different way for different ways for different reasons. Um, but that's what's working for me at the moment. Um, so orchestras, it's a lot of bus processing. And then the prelays or the pre-records or the, you know, just the individual tracks of the synths, the keyboards, the guitars, the drums, those all get processed individually. So that stuff I don't do on buses because, I mean, you just can't. It's all, you know, it's all too different. It's like you couldn't, you couldn't really mix a record that way, right? You need to, you need to go through, you need to clean up, you need to then make something sound awesome. And it's hard to do that if you're just throwing it all through one bus. For sure. So those pre-records, are they... They're not just like a like a that's not what you're replacing with a full orchestra, right? It's it's more like something that is in addition to the orchestra. So the way it usually works is the pre-records are all the tracks that make up the composer's demo. Um, okay. So it's so it's before scoring. It's what the director has been hearing. So there generally are like MIDI or what we call mock up strings and orchestra in there. Gotcha. Right. So you have fake you have fake orchestra in there and then. But you might have, if it's like a hybrid score where it's like electronic and orchestra together, you know, you might have a bunch of synths, drum machines, you know, basses, guitars, whatever. And then you've got the fake orchestra and then you've got the real orchestra, which is meant to replace the fake orchestra. So, yeah, in an, in an ideal scenario, yes, I'm muting those orchestral pre-records and replacing them with the live ones. 
Uh, yeah, I was curious about that. It was almost I was thinking like it's almost like the equivalent of adding drum samples in a way, <laughs> you know, like having having the live sound and then adding this like sampled thing over top of it or this pre-recorded thing over top of it, right? Yeah, and it and it and it it happens. Like I'll, I'll be honest with you, there are times where it's like, you know what, man, there's there's something that the short string samples were doing that uh give an edge that the the real live players didn't really capture. And so sometimes you blend the two together. That's very cool. Very cool. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I think just to see one of these sessions would be incredible to see like how much goes into it. And, you know, good for you for being able to like work so fast with it. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's it's like anything else. And it's like it's it's just like mixing. Right. It's like you learn all this technology. We learn we learn everything we can learn about recording. We learn everything we can learn about mixing. Um then we really get into the weeds with plugins and with compressors and EQs. And there, then you learn about, you know, maybe processes of making a record processes of recording a vocal, chopping a vocal, tuning a vocal, whatever it is, recording an orchestra. Um, It's no different than like, so film mixing is the same thing. It's just another process. And then like, once you learn it, then the whole idea is like, okay, forget about the process and just focus on the music. But it's really like, it's it's very nebulous because I know there's not a lot of people that do it, so not a lot of people know about it. But it's really it's really just a different approach and a different process. And at the end of the day, it's just that it's a process. And once you learn that, then you sit there and you apply your your artistry and your craft to it. For sure. So as far as that process goes, do you have like a typical order that you do things in? Um. Yeah, if it's yeah, I mean, I always will start if if, you know, if the schedule works out this way, which it normally does, I'll always start with just the orchestral sound um, after having listened to a bunch of the music. Right. So you'll have a, you'll have had a bunch of conversations. You'll have hopefully seen the movie already. Know what your client's going for. Know what the director wants. Um, and then you can sit there and listen you know, to just the orchestra, get a sound that, you know, seems to be working for you then open up all the other tracks and see if those two things meld together without having done anything to the other tracks yet. Right. And you know, if you're, if you're, if you're there, then great. If you're like, this is, you know, it's, it's just like drums, right? You start a lot of people, I mean, not everybody, but for me, I always start with my drum sound. So I start with the orchestra sound, then hop over to the other tracks. And when you say you start, sorry, when you say you start with the orchestra sound, you said you have like sometimes a couple hundred mics. So, you know, where, where are you starting with those? Like, are you, is there a specific group of instruments you're starting with? Yes. So I'll start with, um, you know, kind of the main pass, whatever, like the, uh, if there's, let's say there's three passes of orchestra. Okay. So, you know, 120 mics there. Um, I'll go to whatever, like the beefiest passes that has the most stuff going on and I'll mix that and I'll get that sounding how I really want. Um, once that's like, once that's grooving, I can usually then take all those settings and copy them over onto the others. And that'll get me 90% of the way there on the others. And then maybe I'll end up like tweaking EQs because maybe it's the brass, maybe it's the woodwinds and there's just different resonances. Um, but as far as, you know, the basics, it's like, okay, I'll get my balances. Um, then generally the first thing I'll do is I'll, is I'll pop on an EQ and see where kind of the deficiencies in the sound are. Right. So if there's a lot of buildup at like 300, 400 Hertz, right. in that kind of muddy zone. And I'm seeing that throughout the entire piece of music, I can make a pretty good estimation. That's going to be across the entire score. So I can make a cut in the EQ there. Um, then it just becomes about, you know, okay, how's the low end? Do I want to, do I want to throw a more musical, less surgical, but more musical EQ on here and, and beef up the low end a little bit? Do I want to do the same thing to the high end? Is it is it warm and fuzzy enough? Do I want like a little harmonic thing happening? You know, do I want some some tape saturation on it? Um, and then at the same time, I'm also dialing in the reverbs. Yeah, so that's that's the basic. And then I can apply that to the other, you know, the rest of the orchestra. And then I'll hop into the other tracks and start mixing those. And then... And then when I hop into the other tracks, I generally will mute the orchestra, go through those and get the kind of demo sounding how I want it. And then I can bring it all down at the end of the day to like two faders and have, you know, kind of the the program track and the live orchestra. And I can automate them against each other and make them sit really well. That's amazing. Yeah, that's very cool that you like you're just condensing things down. And and I guess to your point that you said earlier of just trying to make things uh, simplified or have, you know, smaller sessions or whatever, you know, that that's exactly 
sounds like the way to work, right? Like condense as much as you can, right? Yeah, VCAs, VCAs are are everything for me because it's like if I can if I can do a bunch of stuff on like three or four faders, that's I'm I'm super happy. Yeah, for sure. And and I also assume too, if you you said you're working in a lot of the same rooms, you're probably just so used to those rooms too that you kind of know what to expect from each of those rooms. Maybe there is that resonant frequency that's always happening somewhere and you, you've already cut that out based on previous mixes that you've done there, right? Right. And what actually gets fun there is is trying to find the sweet spot for things because I, I also get kind of jurisdiction over how we seat the players. Um, and because these rooms are so big, we have a lot of leeway. I mean, more so pre-COVID when we didn't have to worry about distancing. But we have a lot of leeway to go like, hey, you know what, let's move the entire, okay, on this gig, let's try the entire orchestra back 25 feet, more towards the back wall, let's see how the room reacts that way, let's see what what changes. Um, you know, it's just like anybody, you know, that works in the same studio every day over and over again, you find that sweet spot for your drums, you know, and it's like, you go to any studio anywhere, they're like, yeah, that's the drum spot. Um, it's kind of that same thing. So you can uh, you can make those changes before you even record things. Yeah, it makes sense. With COVID, have you guys had to, like, you, you mentioned kind of uh, having smaller sessions. Are you like, is the size of the orchestra just shrinking overall? Or are you like doing more of just like a brass section only and then strings only and then combining all those after the fact? It's it's a little bit of both. It depends. Now we're doing, we're getting to do more people in the room, it seems, and where they're letting us put brass and woodwind players in the room they're problematic because they can't be masked, right? And they, you know, takes a lot of air to make to make noise in a trombone, and that's just blowing a lot. So it was, you know, in the in at the height of the pandemic, it was like no chance you're recording those people. They they have to work at home. Um, so there was a lot of remote recording, which was a bit of a nightmare, but we did it. Um, and did it, uh, it, it weirdly in a uh, in a really satisfactory way. Um, so, so you had everyone just recording their own instrument and sending you those tracks afterwards. Yeah. Wow. So for instance, I did last year, I did, uh, I did Mank with, uh, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross and we did everybody at home for that. Cause that was the middle of the pandemic. Um, that was June, 2020 and every single player was at home with a microphone and then everybody sent back a track and we put it together and it was just like, I did, I did about four four movies that way and it was it, it was really hard but you know people are super resilient and it was amazing to see musicians that had never had almost no you know home recording capability just be in that kind of sink or swim situation again and just figure it out and like there there are films that are coming out now where scores were done completely in isolation and uh you know everybody was able to make it work and figure it out that's incredible. And I, I imagine that the, the there's probably a lot more editing or the mixing process totally changed for you. And, you know, it's for for me, it was kind of the same because I'm lucky to work with a team and um, the guys I work with are, are just like top notch at, at Pro Tools and chopping things up. So like I was able to stay away from that a lot and just get tracks and mix um, for the most part. Uh, but they did, they did just like absolutely incredible work to make, to get me to that point where I can just be like, okay, here are my tracks. I just get to mix, you know, it's more challenging because you're, you know, it's everyone's in their own space in their own room with their own issues. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, it's, I, I it's, it's something I hope we never have to go back to, but I'm, I'm proud of everyone for being able to do it. Yeah. Well, I was curious about that. Cause I feel like so many industries, are pivoting during COVID and they're realizing like they, they're trying things a different way that they've never done it before. And then they're realizing like, oh, wait a minute, that is maybe more of an efficient way to do it. Or like, you know, that kind of thing. So I was curious to know if like that ended up being the sort of situation for you guys where it's like, oh, wait a minute. Now we we know that we can do this, this kind of stuff and, and we'll do more of this. Yeah, I mean, I think for us, it's it's just significantly less efficient we get done with things and we get through music a whole lot quicker with everybody in one place and with the composer being able to, to sit there in real time and go like, you know what, this isn't working. Let's change this. Let's change that. Um, you can't do that in these scenarios. So 
it ended up taking a whole just a lot more time to get things done. Studios had to spend a lot more money on it. Um, so I don't I think some of it will be adopted. But especially like with soloists, you know, like, oh, OK, we just need we need someone to play a cello solo on, you know, three pieces of music. OK, well, we can just send it to them at home. That kind of thing, I think, will you know, which which was already happening outside, you know, just everywhere else. Anyway, it's like we'll probably do a bit more of that. But um, I hope we never go back to full orchestra in isolation. For sure. I imagine that you guys were probably somebody had to have been sending out guidelines of like, okay, this is how we want these recordings to come back to us or, you know, be oh, game yeah. stage or whatever. Right. Like <laughs> you're not just going to make it a free for all. We, we ended up making a, like a kind of a boilerplate PDF that's got, okay, here's how to do the basics in pro tools. Here's how to do the basics in logic. Click this video and we'll show you how to consolidate and export files. Like it was a whole, you know, kind wow. of a uh, DIY home recording. It sucked. It, it wasn't fun. I mean, the, the result didn't suck, but the uh, the process, like many other things during the pandemic, just sucked for everybody. Yeah, totally. That Man, that's incredible. It's uh, it, I love hearing stories like that because it, it it just shows that like sometimes you just have to think on your feet and you have to do something yep. a little different. And you can get a, you can make it work, right? Yeah, I mean, we we all of Hollywood, like the rest of the world, shut off in you know March 2020, and by three weeks later, I, I was on phone calls going like, okay, how are we going to do this? And and ever, studios were like, we got to keep going. We need to make movies. We need to make content. We need to, you know, people are going to run out of things to watch on Netflix. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good point because I I did know that like a lot of. Uh, movie productions had shut down, but, but you, you knew that somebody was making stuff in the background, right? Like the projects, the projects had to keep going. Well, and it's like, okay, so there were so many things that had already filmed that were in the middle of post-production when they shut down. Right. So it's like, okay, we got through the hard part of having everyone on set. And then there's really not any other case. There's no other places in post-production that require a large amount of people to be together except for scoring. Yep. So, you know, the mix stages, fully ADR, it all is you're talking handfuls of people that are needed and versus for our job. It's like, well, no, we need 75, 80 people. Um, so obviously we couldn't get all we couldn't all get together. So that was a uh, that was the challenge. That's incredible, man. That, <laughs> I love I love that. That's a, that's a fun story to hear because you'll look back at this time and be like, we we fucking did it. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We fucking did it. Let's never do it again. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. So, so yeah, we talked a little bit about your mixing process. And um, I guess one of the other big things, especially with you having a musical background, like you started working on bands and working in the studio and, and um, when you're in that world, it's, it tends to be more stereo based, you know? Um, but now like obviously in film, film has been surround for, for a while and there seems to be even more new technologies coming out. Like Dolby Atmos is definitely becoming a very popular thing. Are you mixing in, are you mixing in Atmos right now? I have, um, not, not primarily, but I've done some Atmos mixing recently. Um, it's a, it's, it's the wild, wild west. You know, it's, it's a, it's a true new frontier for audio. And I think there are things about it that are absolutely incredible. Um, and like any sort of bleeding edge of technology, there are other things right now that I just don't think are working. And then there's also for lack of my own imagination, me not being able to see how certain parts of it will be utilized. So I guess what I, to clear, what I mean by that is, um, we go Dolby Atmos for film mixing in music, right? If I if I mix a score, I deliver you know I deliver five point one audio, seven point one audio um, to a music editor. The music editor, because the cut's always changing, right? And it's not like by the time I'm mixing it, everyone's agreed to okay, well we're not going to change anything because music's been recorded. You know, the director's still tweaking and tweaking. That's a really great point too that I that I think a lot of people don't realize with film is that like. The just because you recorded the score one way doesn't mean that it stays that way. The, the, exactly. the picture is changing all the time and the audio is changing all the time. And it, it's more editing than it is re-recording everything. Exactly. It's yeah. I mean, at that point, if they're still making tweaks, which is very common, you know, the music editor has to sit there and conform to the new picture. They have to make all the stems that I've mixed and delivered work. So 
if we're if I'm mixing in Dolby Atmos, there's no stems. It's a Pro Tool session that would be delivered, and it would have all this um, all this pan data and all the object pan data, and the music editor would have to go into the Pro Tool sessions and edit and make sure all the panning that I've done and all the you know the kind of fun Atmos stuff that has happened is is edited and conformed a new picture and just like these are people that are complete they're they're total wizards at pro tools but they do their job on laptops you know because it's they're editing and they're 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 extremely good at it and extremely fast at it and it's going to be hard to say like okay well actually we now need you to be in a dolby atmos room um so as far as music as far as film score being mixed in dolby atmos I think it's going to happen, but I think it's going to be rare for a little while until they figure out that piece. Then once that piece is figured out, I'm pretty sure we'll do a lot of that. The other side of it, um, which I think is a lot more interesting is like the spatial audio and what, you know, Apple music is doing. I think title has it as well. And that's pretty interesting because if you're mixing for, you know, for headphones for binaural, which is part of the Dolby Atmos product it pushes out, um, you can do some really cool stuff. And, you know, right now I know there's this big push with all these labels to go back through their catalogs and put things into spatial audio. Um, if you go on Apple music and you have just a regular pair of headphones, you know, and an iPhone, you can turn on and turn off Dolby Atmos and you can hear, the spatialized version, or you can hear the original version and people are doing it. I think with greatly different degrees of success. Um, I've turned things on and been like, Oh my God, this sounds terrible. Why did they do this? The stereo is perfect. Like don't touch this. Then there's, there's other stuff like uh, a, a colleague and a friend, Steve Genowick is doing all the blue note records, jazz albums in Dolby Atmos. And he's taken these albums and they'd like, he's done it in a way that you sound like you're sitting there in the studio as these guys are recording and it's amazing. So it, I think your, your mileage varies depending on how you're doing things. But I think what's interesting about Dolby Atmos is the idea of an artist, not a film, you know, not a, not a film thing, not a TV thing, but, a, but a musical artist setting out to do a record in Dolby Atmos with the idea that this is for headphones. Um, this is spatialized and I'm going to make sounds and, and craft songs in this environment. And I think when we get there, that's when things are going to get really, really interesting. Yeah. I, I've been very curious about it. Like to me, the, the film side of it has always made sense because we've already been, of course. we've already been using surround sound and it's just kind of going to be an extension of that. I didn't know, but the, the point you brought up about editing is, is a really good point. And that's, I guess that's the stuff that we don't recognize. Right. And, um, and I should, I should say, this is why Dolby Atmos for a, for a final audio mix of a film, is brilliant and is and should be the standard and that's what we should be doing um but that point they're not doing any more edits right they're they they get the final audio so they have the ability to do that we don't yeah so so yeah i mean that's very interesting like i I always did think that the the film side of it made sense but when it came to the music side of it that was the part that i was i I still am kind of struggling with whether or not that's going to stay you know like i i guess time will time will tell but like i don't know that people care about it enough maybe maybe care about it's not the right word but like i I, but i but i think like what's happening is it's kind of like what you said with the the rollout of this is that like a lot of people are trying to figure this out and it's a wild west and so there is those giant extremes of like the people who are doing it right and the people who are doing it poorly and it seems to me like a lot of those old recordings that are being put into atmos like that's not the ideal way to do it. Like the ideal way is to like have those individual tracks and actually make an Atmos mix for real. Starting from scratch and yeah. and yeah, and creating in that environment. I think I think the reason it's not gonna go away, and and just to be um just to give some context here, in two thousand seven, I had a conversation with a friend and I said I don't think this Apple phone thing is gonna work. Like they're a computer company. Nobody everyone love we all love our Blackberries, like Look at this thing. It's difficult. Like, I don't think this is going to fly. So all this to say, don't listen to me, you know, not great <laughs> at predicting the technological future. But um, I think what's what's interesting with Dolby Atmos is, you know, any 4K television you're buying right now, any um, any high quality soundbar you're buying, these all have Atmos capability built in already. And more and more consumer products are coming with Atmos capability. 
the fact that I can stream from my phone to my headphones or even just plug in regular headphones and listen in Dolby Atmos binaural, it's already there. So there's kind of, I know exactly what you're saying. Like, will people care? I don't know that people will care, but I think as we build Atmos systems, for instance, in cars, which I think five to 10 years from now, that's going to be the standard because why not? You're, you're in one listening position. They know exactly where you are. They can make a really cool, you know, Harman Kardon Atmos thing. Um, I think it's just slowly going to become the standard, but I think it's going to take time. And I don't know that anybody will really freak out and be like, I need to buy an Atmos system for my house. That's not going to happen. I think for headphones, it gets really interesting. And for, yeah, probably in car as well. Yeah, that's a good point, too, because I do think that, yeah, the audiophiles and the people that have like their home theater systems or whatever, like they're they'll care about having a, a 7-1 system or whatever. Sure, sure. Yeah, but they but they those those people aren't the ones that will affect the change. It's the ones that are like listening on headphones and just they're just continuing to subscribe to Apple Music or subscribe to Tidal. And as long as they're doing that, then, you know, these new formats will come out because they're possible. That's true. And also, you know, with with Apple kind of leading the charge with a lot of this, like that they're just implementing into our normal commercial or consumer products. And so, yeah, we're, you know, it's always going to be around us. So we'll just get used to it being the thing where, you know, it's it's not going to be like um, it's not going to be like Laserdisc or something like that, where it's like, hey, we've got this new platform, like people should try this and buy this and see if it works any better. Right. When you when you have that option, you're not going to do it. <laughs> I think it's I think it's more just going to be like cameras or or televisions where it's like, okay you know what? The next camera I buy has more megapixels then the next one has more megapixels. You know, this TV's got whatever. This next one I purchase is 4K. Next one's 8K, you know, whatever. It's just capabilities that will just be showing up in these products and that will drive us to to do this. And all the other side of that is and this is kind of on Dolby to figure it out they're going to have to make a much more accessible user-friendly interface within DAWs so that people can sit at home and have headphones on and, and write music in Dolby Atmos. And I think that's coming as well. Probably, probably, you know, in no short order. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. Cause it's, it's not something that's like commercially like, well, easily available, you know, like it, there's definitely a, like for anyone who's interested in learning about it, there's a big cost involved in getting started with it and, and learn a big learning curve with it as well. So, you know, yeah, not not everyone has the budget for 12 speakers in their room. So so it's I think once they get to a point where people can create with it wearing headphones, then you really have something. Yeah, when when Apple starts putting Atmos mixing abilities into a garage band, that that's that's when everyone starts using it. <laughs> I I I bet we'll see that in Logic in the next year or two. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised by that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it's their software. Why wouldn't they? Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. But it's um, I was I was really, really kind of uh, a get off my lawn old man about it for a long time. Just being like, who cares about this? It's nobody has these Atmos setups at home. And then with the spatial audio headphone thing, I was like, OK, hang on. This makes a lot more sense. Um, forget the, you know. 9.1.2 Atmos rooms for as far as making just creating music for albums and records and just throw on headphones and you can do it. It's like, that's a different thing. Yeah, for sure. I think that's a great spot to wrap up. You know, we've covered your whole process, everything from the recording stage, the mixing stage, and what is happening with the future of uh, film production and film music. So I think this is a good spot to wrap up. For people who might be interested in learning more about you and following you online or uh, possibly even working with you, what's the best place that people can go to find out more about you? Um, good question. I guess Instagram, probably. It's just like at Scott Michael Smith. I think there's an underscore after that. Um, and then, you know, my website, I think, is scottmichaelsmith.net. So you can go there. I don't update it as regularly as I should, but I'm pretty af- active on Instagram. So that's that's probably best. Awesome. And lastly, are there any cool projects that you're working on that you might be able to talk about right now? Um, yeah, it's funny. Yes, there are cool projects I'm working on, but everything I'm starting, which I'm super, super excited about, are things I can't yet discuss. Um, I will say not that, not that I'm recording an orchestra this weekend and I'm doing it with a couple of the uh, Placid Audio carbon phones, which are all carbon microphones. 
Nice. It's, it's a carbon microphone design, or a lot of people might be familiar with the carbon phone. Um, so I've got some things I'm working on where I get to uh, experiment a lot and get really weird with the orchestra and uh similar gig has uh we've got a date booked at capital we're doing three drummers and a percussionist all in the same room together so there's there's just like there's a couple i can't talk about the projects but there's musically there's some things i'm really excited about that's awesome man well very very cool i'm looking forward to checking those out whenever they come out and i'm sure we'll see your name attached to those credits and yeah (laughs) it'd be cool to check out awesome awesome Awesome. man well well, thank you again for taking the time to do this really do appreciate it and uh yeah looking forward to hearing what you're working on So that was my interview with Scott Michael Smith, and that was really, really cool. I loved hearing the process that goes into recording orchestras and how much work is involved. And I also thought it was really fascinating to hear how they pivoted during COVID and were having all of these musicians recording themselves at home. I think that that's just such a major project to tackle, but at the same time, it really does show the power of home recording studios and how what used to be only something you could record in a large hall could now be recorded in a bedroom or in a basement. And these people are coming together, making these tracks sound incredible. And with people like Scott mixing it and editing it and putting it all together, you know, we are able to hear these amazing final sounding products inside of the movies and TV shows that we watch. So I just think that it's a really cool accomplishment to achieve. And I also think it says a lot about the technology that we have these days and how you can create great recordings from home. So I hope that you enjoyed this podcast. And if you did, please make sure to subscribe to it. That way you're notified about all new episodes as they go live. And if you could also leave a review on Apple Podcasts, that would be greatly appreciated as well. That just allows us to spread the word about the podcast, expand it to new ears, and to continue to get great guests on the show. And lastly, if you enjoy this podcast, definitely make sure to go to MasterYourMix.com. That is where I help musicians create pro-sounding recordings from their home studios. And on that website, I've got tons of great resources designed to help make the process of mixing easy. And one of which that you're definitely going to want to check out is called The Mixing Mindset. This is a book that I put out a few years ago. It became an Amazon number one bestseller. And inside of this book, we break down the entire process of mixing from knowing exactly what steps you need to take, what you need to listen to, what plugins you should be looking at, how to analyze your tracks, and so much more. If you struggle to get your mixes sounding clear and polished, then this book is going to give you that process to follow so that you can feel proud of your music and excited to share it. So definitely make sure to check it out. Once again, that's called The Mixing Mindset, and it's a book available at MasterYourMix.com. So that is it for this episode, guys. I hope that you enjoyed that, and we'll talk in the next one. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at masteryourmix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit masteryourmix.com.